Hey, uh, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining again um, on the second of our public sector webinars. Um, today's topic is the effects of COVID-19 on the collection of council tax and business rates, but with a particular view on the, the role of enforcement agents in that. Um, I'm pleased to say that um, we are again joined today by a, a great panel, um, and that uh, this webinar has been uh, Organized in partnership with the IRV, whose chief executive David Magor is with us again today. Uh, we also have uh, Nick Rowe, uh, assistant director of local tax and accounts receivables at the London Borough of Ealing, and John Woolridge, who's the head of revenue at the London Borough of Redbridge. I'm also pleased to say that we have uh, Jamie Waller with us today, who is a, an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and investor, and also the chairman of um, Aram as well. Um, so before I go and do some more of the introductions of the workshops, perhaps I could um, ask those uh, panelists to briefly introduce themselves to the people who are joining us new to this panel. David, can I start with you? Could you just give us a few minutes introduction to yourself? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Magor. I am the Chief Executive of the Institute of Revenues Rating and Valuation. And for those who know the Institute, we are an organisation very much involved in the collection of council tax. And I am very much looking forward to today's event. Thank you. Uh, Nick, over to you. Yeah, uh, Nick Rowe, Assistant Director for Local Taxation at London Borough of Ealing. Um, 35 years in local government, majority of which have been working in local taxation. Um, also a National Council member for IRRV. And much the same as David, looking forward to getting involved in the discussion and debate this afternoon. Thank you. Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Jonathan Waldridge. I'm the Head of Revenues for Redbridge Council uh, in East London. Um, I've, um, I'm really looking forward to this afternoon's session. If nothing else but to listen to David again, probably the last session we had was fantastic. So I hope that um, we all get this opportunity to, 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 to learn, learn from David. I, yeah, I agree. I just will need just to hand over to David and let him let him explain and tell us about it. Thank you. Uh, and Jamie, finally, please, um, you're, you're new to our webinar this week, so perhaps you could tell us a bit more about yourself and uh, your role. Yeah, absolutely. So Jamie Waller, I'm the chairman of both Just and Aram. Um, spent 23 years working in the enforcement of debts and mainly all business to government. So I started my career as an enforcement agent or a bailiff, as they were once known, uh, went on to set up a, a bailiff company of my own age 21 called JBW Group, now the second largest group of bailiff companies in the country. Uh, and I sold that business to the large uh, firm of outsourcers in 2017. Uh, since that time, I acquired Aram and set up Just, which is a new to market enforcement market integrator, but particularly concentrating on the utility sector at the moment. So how do you build a, an integrator that brings together best practice and delivers a, a sort of a, a, one, a one type of solution, regardless of where a debtor might live? Great, thank you. Thank you. So um, let me just give you some of the uh, usual housekeeping stuff that uh, we go through. Um, so, uh, I'm hoping you can all see and hear us. Um, if you can't, please drop a line to our moderators and, and we'll try and solve any problems that you might have. Um, you won't be able to see or hear each other because um, we turn that off just to try and focus uh, the attention on, on the panellists. Um, if I could, just in case your micro microphone isn't on mute, please can I ask you to put it on mute. Uh, panellists, you're fine. Please leave yours on if you're OK. Okay, um, we are very keen to hear from you. So um, you should all see on the right hand side of your screen a Q&A button. Um, I'm already seeing we've got some questions coming through, which is great. So please feel free to ask questions as we go along and I'll try and bring some of those in um, to you through this. Um, we've also got some polls um, to run today, like we did last week, uh, to hear your views as well. So we should be running those as well, so keep an eye for those. Um, and finally, um, we're very keen to hear um, your views about the workshop itself. And thank you for those who gave us your feedback uh, after the last session. Um, we had some very good feedback. And uh, in response to some of the comments, we've uh, increased sort of the, the scope of this session today to uh, business rates as well as council tax, uh, because the topic, I think, probably deserves that. Um, and uh, we'll, also, we'll also be trying to run more polls through the session again in, in response to your, your feedback. So. Um, please, um, at the end of the session today, you'll have an opportunity to give us more feedback. So we're very here to. 
So before we, we get into the discussion, um, I'd like to just perhaps share some, some thoughts in terms of context. Um, so Hannah, can we move forward to the first slide? So um, I've been trying to look this week about into well, what's the situation out there? What's the, the reality that, that we are currently facing? Uh, clearly there are lots of opinions and lots of views, but what evidence, what, what data do we have? Um, and this is a graph taken from the most recent um, uh, report by HM Treasury on the state of finances. Um, and as you'll see, this, this just um, starts the collection of cash tax receipts um, over the last four years by quarter. Um, and the key thing you'll see there is that the trend in previous years is continuing. Um, and quarter one is often the worst quarter, or is always the worst quarter. But quite importantly, we haven't seen uh, a big drop off in uh, cash tax revenues. Move to the next slide, please, Hannah. Uh, this is the same uh, graph, but for business rates, and again, um, over the last four years by quarter, the same trend that we are seeing in previous years, we've seen again, uh, with quarter one being the worst one, um, and actually not a huge difference in terms of drop off from previous years. Now, when you look at those, you think, well, where's the problem? It's the same as usual, um, until you start looking into the detail behind the graphs, uh, as I did, and I found that actually these graphs are not actuals, they are projections. Uh, projections that the Treasury have made, forecasts, based on um, the model that the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, have put together, which brought chart the, the impact of, of COVID-19 um, going forward. When you then look into to the uh, detail of that particular model, it makes an assumption that any losses in, in uh, uh, revenues to local government will be made up by government. So in effect, they're saying, actually, um, the assumption is that there will be no loss of revenue. So interestingly from central government, um, at least, is, is well, what, what's their understanding of a real picture if, if certainly some of their modelling at the minute is, is perhaps not as, as uh, sophisticated as we might hope in terms of the impact. So if we then look to, on the next slide please, Hannah, to, to actually what is the sector saying? Um, you've all been returning um, your monthly returns to uh, central government and um, the uh, MHCLG, who keep changing their name every year of the year, which be quite quite substantially. I still remember the days when it was the ODPM, and God knows how many changes we've had since then. Um, a, we have uh, a report here that was published, I think, on the 21st of June, which is a summary of the data that councils submitted back in May. Um, and just again, some headline numbers there. Um, you, as a sector, are projecting by the end of this year a loss in council tax of, of um, almost 1.7 billion and a loss of business rates of uh, just over uh, a billion. So quite significant numbers, but actually not as much as what you are thinking you will lose in um, sales fees and charges. So things like uh, leisure charges and, and other fees and charges that you, that you would normally um, charge for your services. Um, um, so interesting that the sector are, are, are saying that's obviously going to be a quite significant impact. Um, but more importantly, these numbers are over a month old. So the, some of the uh, discussions that we've been hearing this month have been that actually the, these uh, gaps are actually growing even more. So the, the scale of the challenge that we face is certainly much bigger than, than these, these numbers suggest. But I'm sure, as uh, Jonathan will, will remind us later, these are just projections. We don't know what the situation will be at the end of the year. Um, it may be better than this. It may be worse than this. Uh, so that's sort of the, the view from national and, and, and local government. And if we can move to the next slide, please. That change produced a report uh, a few weeks ago, um, which is based on a survey uh, that they ran. And this tries to show the, the perspective of, of the people, everyday people, the debtors in particular, uh, in terms of what we are, are seeing. So. Um, some, some key numbers there that are some quite big numbers and some quite, quite great numbers sometimes, but um, you know, 40 million people have been negatively affected by, by uh, coronavirus, um, of which you know, 3.4 million people were showing signs of difficulty even before um, we got into this. Um, 820,000 people have, are already saying that they're falling behind on council tax bills, um, 170,000 people most importantly, who are previously not in any problems, um, expect to be in, in, in more problems 
um, going forward. Um, the data that um, uh, Step Change uh, achieved from their survey was actually quite similar to the survey that we ran um, last uh, last webinar with YouGov, where essentially we found that 25% of our respondents felt that they would they would struggle, and and um, likewise you, uh, Step Change found that 28% of their respondents said that they would struggle with debts going forward. So um, it is it is quite a challenge from the personal point of view. Um, and we then consider one in 10 renters are falling behind in their uh, debts, 2.7 million people taking some form of, of payment break um, in terms of either their mortgage or, or some of their other debts. Actually, what we see here is, is not only some severe vulnerabilities now, but potentially a lot of, of um, problems being stored up for when at some point we all hopefully get back to normal um, and um, everyone starts to, to um, demand payment of some of these debts that perhaps have been paid um, over the course of the last three or four months. Um, and we certainly know from what the government have, have uh, suggested that furlough scheme will, will end in October. Um, and certainly in the UK, I think in, in England, England, I believe off the top of my head, some like six point four million people are, are on furlough at the moment. So some some quite a big sort of uh, people there who who um, and could potentially be impacted once once furlough, furlough comes uh, uh, comes off, uh, off off stream. I think that's the last slide, please. And if there's any more, just uh, check. No, I think so. So I think that's certainly the the um, view from national perspective, from the data that we can get. I think what would be really useful now is if perhaps we could hear what it's like on on the ground. Um, Nick, Jonathan, can I ask you to perhaps just share your experience at the moment? What are you seeing on the ground? Um, what are you doing in terms of trying to address some of these problems of trying to collect revenue in some very challenging circumstances? Nick, would you mind starting off uh, with your experience? Really? Yeah, I mean, I think from a local authority perspective, we are used to being um, in a financial mess to a certain extent. I think you know, government cuts on local authority budgets have happened for years and years. So, you know, we've lost, I think, something crazy like £143 million of government grants over the past few years. So for every pound we used to get, effectively, we're getting about 36p, I think it is now. So we are used to this, but COVID has just thrown everything up in the air. We're estimating that for Ealing Council, there will be a funding gap of around 40, 40 million for this year. And I think the a significant part of that is going to be on local taxation, and that's council tax and business rates. And I think we talked last time that we need to start collecting, but we know these households are suffering severe financial hardship in many cases. So it's trying to get our collection strategy um, in line that allows us to take action that is seen as proportionate to the debt that's owed by our customers. And I think that's hopefully some of the issues we'll come on to today and discuss about how we're going to be tackling that. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, what's the view from, from Redbridge? Well, I can only, I can only share uh, the view that, that Nick has. I mean, it is, it is a, it's unprecedented times to use the overused word of the, of the year. but. Um, I think just to pick up on the fact the the proportionate amount is the proportionate amount of effort that we put into enforcement now needs to come to the fore. I mean, for Redbridge at the moment, we're really looking to look at how we can adapt all of our services to protect residents from from the from the onset of a recession, which is is not undoubtedly going to uh, affect them affect their pockets. But over the last few months, we've had a lot of contact from a lot of uh, vulnerable people. We've supported so many people and, and, and at a great expense because we're, we're reporting, as you've probably seen in, in the news, um, huge losses across, across all local government. But in particular for Redbridge, uh, we're talking of a of tune of £60 million pounds is, the, is, the, is the gap that we're talking about. And, and through, through all of the work we've done, We've captured a lot of information from a, from the most vulnerable people. So for us, for the moment, we need to go back to capitalise on on that contact we've had, capitalise on that data that we've that we've 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 um, that we've managed to collect, and now use that to in our proportionate response back to to collecting the council tax. Um, as it stands at the moment, we we are keen to 
get get that enforcement process working uh, again. And we've done as much as we, we can. I guess we might come on to some more about that. But I think for the moment, we've got to be making sure that we're working as smart as possible, um, utilizing all of our tools whilst keeping our costs down, because that's, 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 that's just, there's just no money. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Um, Jamie, you um, obviously talk to lots of businesses in your role uh, as an entrepreneur, and also you are involved in lots of charities and, and other improper activities. Um, from your perspective, what do you think the businesses and the public in general are expecting from local authorities at this point? Do they expect them to, to collect outstanding debts or perhaps take a different approach? It, it might be better that I <clears throat> share some of more relevant experience from the energy sector at the moment. So just work for some of the biggest energy suppliers in the country. So we manage their enforcement services, so their bailiff uh, contracts. And what we are, what we are seeing there is they're not too dissimilar to local authority in the debt type, you know, a utility debt and and the sort of households that they're having to collect from. And they've also they've built their entire collection system around having access to enforcement. So to have that just removed from them all of a sudden has been very very painful, and and debt has been building up quite significantly. And they're also quite similar to local authorities because they, they are strapped for cash, actually, you know, since price caps came in and and also uh, the easeability to switch. And what we're seeing there is that they, they, they want to start enforcement again and actually will start enforcement again. So the regulator has now given that green light. And there was questions over if they would allow enforcement to to restart in the, in this calendar year, but they will. But they do absolutely demand that it that it looks different to what it looked like pre COVID nineteen, and I think that's what people are going to expect. I don't think that there will always be people that expect enforcement to be dumped and never used, but those people aren't being realistic. And we all know that if you don't have enforcement, then compliance declines. So. I think what people expect, and I don't think it's a person, I don't think it's an unfair expectation, is that when uh, the when somebody press go well, presses go again on enforcement services, that they can justify why they are doing it. And I think the best way to justify why you are doing it is to show that the manner in which it's done has changed to take into account that the world is a different place. And I can uh, give you some specifics on that a bit later on on some of the stuff that's happening in you know what that change might look like. Okay, thank you. Um, as the panelists have been talking, we've run our first poll and the results are in. Uh, the question was, do local government proactively use BEZ to collect outstanding current house tax and, and uh, business rates debt? 82% um, of our respondents agree that, that uh, local authorities should, but 18% don't. So David, perhaps could I come to you and say, well, what's the argument for not using bailiffs at the moment? I, it tends to be a political argument or a, or a, a member driven argument. I think the elected members are very wary of um, how they handle their public at the moment, because obviously everybody's in difficulty. And I think we're seeing uh, the, the, the typical response from local authorities. I think members are getting more directly involved in the collection process. And I think that will get worse. I think members will see uh, their local communities beginning to suffer, and I think they will expect their officers to take uh, the, the appropriate action to ensure that the burden is not too great. It's interesting because listening to, uh, to, to Nick and Jonathan, you know, we, we are in the early days of this. You know, we're only three months into the current financial year, and of course, the real pain of um, of, of COVID-19 um, and the recession that's obviously going to follow has not been felt. When furlough comes to an end, we don't know at all the, the impact of that uh, of that uh, termination. Will it lead to thousands and thousands, millions of redundancies? You know, I have employers just put people on furlough just to hold them for a while, and then as soon as furlough ends, we'll see masses of redundancies. That could have a dramatic effect on local authorities, both in terms of their council tax reduction schemes, their council tax collection, and of course, rent collection and all the other associated issues. 
Well, I think it's even worse than that because the the, the wider effects are, are the impact of the economy. Is the economy go, are we going to see an instant recovery in the economy? And so, will there be more jobs around, or will there be less jobs? It's 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 awful nowadays. When one turns on the news, you just wait to hear who's going to be the next major employer to reduce their number of employees. And of course, this morning we had Airbus. And you know, who would have thought that Airbus would start to run into difficulty? But there again, when you look at the trail, it's logical that they're bound to. If there's no if there's no international travel, no, the airlines are all suffering. They're going to need less planes, and that's where you know things start to get really dramatic. And I think if you take that down to a lower level, local businesses, local industry, you're going to see retail not necessarily recovering as quickly as people hope it will. You're going to see bigger fa factories laying people off because there's not uh, the market for their products that they used to be and that will have the knock-on effect of effect of, of, of the individual in a household not having the money to pay their council tax so i just think we're at the beginning of a tsunami and i don't think we've got the real effect of that yet that's to come and this is a problem that's going to be with us for another three or four years this is not going to go away instantly and i think Local authorities are going to have to start thinking about their debt collection strategies and the extent to which they use enforcement agents, how they work with enforcement agents. It could be the opening for a brand new relationship with enforcement agents. There could be lots of opportunities to change the way that uh, local authorities and enforcement agents work together. There are real opportunities to um, develop the single view of debt and how we deal with that. And remember, as all these things are happening, without wishing to add any more gloom to this statement, um, the government's introducing new legislation. We're going to see breathing space come in. Uh, that's going to take effect from uh, from May 2021. Uh, that's going to affect local authority recovery. We're going to see uh, the, the, the Cabinet Office have just launched a debt fairness uh, consultation. We're going to see the outcome of that. And of course, the third sector are very aggressive in terms of the way the council tax system works. So an awful lot on the agenda, I'm afraid. Yeah, quite so. Um, Healy, if, if obviously local authorities pursue um, enforcement, um, the, the age old argument of, of fairness and, and, and ethic, equity and as well as sort of the ethics of that coming, we saw from the, some of those stats that um, that change produced that obviously there are lots of people who are already in difficulty. As soon as we engage in enforcement agents, obviously we, we add to the burden of that debt by additional fees. Um, lots of enforcement agents talk now of, of ethical collections. In your view, does that change the way we should be approaching um, um, collections at all, or actually is it the same as before? David, sorry, up to David. Fine, okay. Well, I, I think, ethical collection it's about the relationship it's about the client contractor relationship the client is the local authority the, that's the primary client local authorities um, manage their council taxpayers and their residents and they want to have a good strong relationship with those people the last thing they want to do is to get into a confrontational situation so i think you're going to see the relationship between the enforcement agent and the local authority be modified and i think that modification can take lots of different forms I, I'm, I'm looking at perhaps at the bigger picture. I, you know, to me, the enforcement process starts with the first reminder notice and it ends, you know, tragically in some cases to commit a prison, but generally it ends with, you know, aggressive action if the debt's not paid. What we want to do is to look at that broad process. That's the reminder notice through the magistrate's court, looking at the various remedies and then coming to a conclusion, drawing those things together and saying, how do we help people? How does the enforcement industry work much more closely with the local authorities to have a much smoother and more productive relationship? Thank you. Uh, while you've been talking, we, we've run our second poll um, on um, the engagement of elected members um, in the use of bailiffs. And I can report that's roughly 50, 50, ooh, 52, 48, some very famous numbers. Um, 52 who have not and who have not yet engaged their uh, elected members in discussions around the use of bailiffs, and 48 that, that haven't. Um, Nick, uh, David spoke there about perhaps changing the approach to collections from the, what might have been a standard approach um, not so long ago. How have you in Ealing changed your approach to um, or the relationship with your bailiffs? Uh, and what are you doing perhaps just to try and ease um, the pressures on on um, House taxpayers are already perhaps struggling a bit more than they would normally do. 
Yeah, sorry. I mean, I think the first thing I would just add is that in terms of ethical collections, I think all of, well, hopefully everyone on the call would agree that their enforcement agents act in an ethical manner. And I think the term ethical um, enforcement came around from one particular company, but I think we all take an ethical approach to our collection strategies. And a lot of that is around um, identifying the customer, finding out more about the customer, doing things like propensity to pay. I think on the last um, call, David talked a lot about can't pays and won't pays. And that's going to really, really um, increase significantly for the people who genuinely can't afford to pay to those who can afford to pay but are choosing not to. And they're the ones we have to take action against. And I think most authorities now are reviewing collection strategies to use um, data we hold internally, use of external data to find out more about the customer, to find out about the ability to pay. And if people have the ability to pay, then they've got a, a duty and a legal um, obligation to pay us. If they can't pay, then we need to work with those customers to find mutually agreeable arrangements where they can pay over time. There's no point of us adding court costs, enforcement fees to someone who is already um, suffering severe financial hardship. It's not going to help anyone in the long run. So we need to take that sort of approach. And I think most authorities have tailored recovery strategies since the introduction of COVID, you know, we haven't been able to do um, our bulk liability order runs and we don't know when they're coming back. So suddenly authorities are reviewing reminder letters they're sending to actually change the wording to get customers to engage with us. And that engagement is proving vital. And it's only through that that we're actually getting um, the revenue collections we're getting at the moment. And I think that's a lesson we're going to learn that our recovery strategies probably need to be more tailored than some of the more traditional conveyor belt recovery approaches that local authorities took. Thank you for that. Jonathan, what's your view on, on what Nietzsche said about sort of amending the way you do things, using data to be more targeted in your approach? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, we've, 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 tried, we've tried at Redbridge this year to segment our data in, into, into, into those defaulters from, from, from previous, year, previous years that, that we know are going to end up going down this route. And sadly, they're they're in that situation whether there was a a pandemic or or, or not. I think it's for us. No, we as I said before about the data that we tried to collect over the last few months. I think there is a change in the relationship to, with us and the and the enforcement agents that that David alluded to. We've we we're now seeing that uh, we're trying to identify so many more vulnerable people before it gets to the EA. But actually, if the EA is knocking on the door and discovering that someone's vulnerable then we failed because the local authority has so much information at its at its disposal that actually we ought to be knowing who our debtors are in a lot better way than we really do. So if, if we are looking at how that relationship between the two parties works, it almost needs to come together that you have uh, the EA working closely with the uh, local authority to, to develop that uh, fin final part of the of the jigsaw perhaps in the the, the final part where you have the, the, the EA knocking on the door, completing that, that circle. But it, it would already be already be for, for the local authority to identify these vulnerable parties early on and intervene with them. It almost feels like we failed if we have got to that doorstep and, and, and not had a chance to do that. We've, we've seen now uh, so many more people contacting us with, uh, circum with the circumstances that we were, probably weren't aware of in, in the past. And I think having done that, we can get to a position where we can define what's vulnerable and how we can ethically treat those um, or more fairly treat those uh, residents. And next, right, uh, the cost, the cost problem, the, the whole local authority government uh, and the funding of local authorities is needs to be brought into 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 the into the equation as well because of the way in which we kept we add our costs on and how the local authorities are financed. It's perverse that if we do well in collection, we're going to have a budget pressure in trying to square our our, our own internal finances. So we need that amount of uh, of debt enforcement and cost being added on in order to to survive. So I don't know how we how we would how we would survive if we were not um, not adding those those costs. But Nick Nick is right. We need we, there's no there's little point in adding those costs on if we're not going to collect them and this is actually making that problem a lot worse for that debtor, that resident. Okay, thank you. 
Jamie, um, Sibia, which is the um, Association, Civil Thought Association, um, announced um, a, a while ago some a men, changes to their procedures of their members, at least, to try and address some of the, the concerns that people are, are raising now in terms of, of bailiff behaviour. Um, so some of the changes that they've, they've sort of raised are um, doing some pre-visit letters, um, doing more on vulnerability, as, as the panelists have suggested, um, perhaps giving more notice of visits before, before they take place. Do you feel that's, that's sufficient in terms of responding to the new world that we're in, or, or from your experience, should they be perhaps doing more? Or indeed, perhaps should local authorities be doing more to help the bailiffs do their, their roles? Well, I think I think the sorry. proposal is pretty. Sorry, Jamie. Sorry, Jamie. David, I thought that was Carry on. So, so, yeah, for my opinion, I think Sivir have done a good job, and we must remember they're a trade association, so they represent, you know, maybe a, a business that's just two people and a, and a business that's 2,000 people. So while people, some people have publicly criticised them, saying they could have done more, they probably couldn't have done more and been a fair representative of, of their membership base. So I think they've, they've done a lot. Do I, I think a lot of the things that they have offered, one might say, actually, are, are just, what the regulations require you to do anyway if you detect vulnerability you should stop etc um but i think i think in the main they they have done a very good job and they've got a difficult task because the likes of step change and the cab etc are never going to come out and pat them on the back regardless of what they do but there's always more that you can do i think where the creditor so the local authority could potentially do more to assist the entire process um but it's difficult in local government is around this sort of central view of a debtor. So, you know, I was talking about the energy sector earlier on. What what I I've been very surprised with the way the energy sector have dealt with returning to enforcement, which is that they have taken it upon themselves in the main to say that if we were to rather than all use different suppliers, use a global supplier that held the data, then that would be less fees passed on to the debtors because the regulations require the debts to be grouped together and collected at the same time. The order of priority on which creditor gets paid first is determined by the date the court order is issued to the bailiff, so that's taken care of, so that's good for the creditor too. And ultimately, that's their big justification for being able to return because of what they then say as well, we have we've we've changed the service to you know all using a mixture of suppliers to use it one central data holder, which means that the debt is being charged considerably less. We are recovering our principal amounts considerably faster, and ultimately uh, you, you, the process has changed from what it is today or what it was pre-COVID-19, which is sort of a first past the post wins where you've got, even in within one local authority, you might have five different bailiff contracts, right? You might have one for business rates, two for council tax, and two for parking. Well, that could be five different bailiffs turning up at the same debtor's address, charging five sets of fees. And because the bailiffs are only paid if they're successful, it creates an overzealous approach. And I'm not saying it's an aggressive approach. I'm not, I think the, the, the enforcement companies, as Nick said, have done wonderful over the past 20 years in, in the way they've changed. But unfortunately, the incentives are wrong. The incentives are that if you don't get paid, if you don't get the money, you don't get paid. And if you know that in 10 minutes time, a bailiff could turn up from a different company for a different debt owed to the same council, and get that money off the debtor before you manage to get yours, then it creates the wrong behavior. And one thing I wouldn't mind just leaving a bit of a thought on, and maybe we can come across it a bit later once people have had the time to digest it. I think the biggest fear about enforcement at the moment, and I've not heard anyone talk about it, but I've been thinking about it and doing some research on it over the past month or so, is that there's two and a half thousand certificated enforcement agents in the country of which approximately 85% of them are self-employed. Of that 85%, if you take a quick search on LinkedIn this afternoon uh, and search the term enforcement agent, the commentary from these people is that they are starving alive because they, they happen to slip out of the government support scheme. They weren't employed, so they didn't get furloughed. They hadn't been self-employed for long enough to get full entitlement of benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So 
one of the things that certainly we have been focusing on in the utility sector of recent is how do you handle financially vulnerable enforcement agents who are paid on commission only in the main 85 percent of them visiting financially vulnerable debtors and what environment is that going to create and i think that is i'm we don't have an answer for it um but i think it's an interesting thing to to, to consider because i think Again, the regulations and the incentives around enforcement were not right pre-COVID-19, um, and they're certainly not fit for purpose post. Very interesting. I'll, I'll pose some of those questions to David in a moment, but just before I, I do, we've, we've had another poll, um, and uh, the majority of people perhaps are either not sure or don't believe um, that um, the changes introduced by Severe are going to be sufficient to address the concerns. Um, I suppose one concern might be um, just about volume, um, Jamie, that, um, as you say, some of these activities should have been taking place anyway in terms of looking for vulnerability, perhaps doing pre-visit checks before you go. Um, if uh, the situation, as happens at the end of August, the tax turn back on again and lots of authorities start using their bailiffs, do you think the bailiffs have the capacity to cope with that demand and they'll be able to actually live up to some of these higher standards of, of behaviour that they are now signing up to? What pressures are you seeing within the market that perhaps might, that might prevent that? Well, they, they, they certainly won't be able to deal with the demand because the, the industry has never been able to deal with the demand. I mean, each year more things are decriminalised. You know, you have a toll bridge open up that floods the industry with another 10% of, of workload. There's always actually, uh, so I, I became a certificated bailiff in 1998. And when I became a certificated bailiff, there was 1,900 certificated bailiffs. There are only 2,500 now. It's always been around that 2,000 mark. Um, and what, you, what you've seen during COVID-19 is a lot of these people have gone off and got alternative jobs because, you know, that they've, they've had to, to survive. So I think that 2,500 might now be... I don't know, 2,000, it might be 1,000. We really don't know. And unfortunately, you'll never know because when you when you change job, you don't sort of hang up your license. You just wait for it to expire, which could take up to two years. We won't know the impact of the, the supply chain um, when actually we need to know it. But what we will know is that the demand is going to increase because there's been a backlog, right? And not only has there been a backlog, more people are going to suffer. So I think, the industry itself has a lot of challenges to overcome on how is it going to recruit and train people while it's doing that? How does it control its own agents to ensure that they are not overzealous in their approach because they are determined um, and have this massive desire to start making money again themselves? I think that is the challenge that the industry has and ultimately the local authorities have because if that behaviour is overzealous, then ultimately it's going to reflect bad, badly on them. Thank you for that. David, um, Jamie suggested a, a different approach there uh, to sort of uh, tackling or, or the use of, of bailiffs in, in tackling or collecting debt. Uh, and you alluded to earlier to this, this single view of, of a debtor. What's really holding local authorities back from taking those types of single view coordinated approaches to collecting debts across multiple multiple services or debt streams? I suspect it's the pressure of work. I, I think what, what you're finding currently is that uh, local authority revenue sections are under immense pressure. Uh, the pressure has been caused by government. Uh, they've, given, they've placed lots of duties and responsibilities on the shoulders of local government, particularly in relation to the grant system. And those two grants have virtually brought revenue sections to a standstill. So that's been you know, the immediate effect. When that's all settled down, and of course the grant, the impact of the grants will, will disappear very shortly, hopefully, um, local authorities can then turn their attention to perhaps using data more effectively and using their data, their own data more effectively. Um, the single view of a debt has got, has got to be the single view of the debt across the whole process, whether it be local authority debt or, or, or other debt. That, that's difficult to achieve, but the starting point should be for local authorities to, to segment their caseload, to differentiate between can't payers and won't payers, make sure that they understand exactly who their council taxpayers are, because there are lots of council taxpayers that are not going to be affected. Their direct debits will be quite normal. Older people are still getting full council tax reduction. So all of those people 
shouldn't be impacted by what's happening with COVID-19, but you should concentrate on this growing group of working age people who are in difficulty, and then really look at them in some detail. I, I always believe that when you start to talk to someone who's in debt, the first thing you need to be satisfied with is the, the security of the family. Have they got a secure home? Is that home properly funded? Are they up to date with their rent? Are they up to date with their mortgage? Are they got no commitments at all of that of that nature? Once you've achieved that and you know they've got that secure position, you can then start to look at the wider debt picture. If you don't deal with that security around housing first, you're in danger of creating more problems because if you force a family as a result of aggressive council tax collection or wider debt collection into a homelessness homelessness situation, all you're doing is raising a general fund debt in another portion of the local authority because the cost of homelessness particularly if there are children in that family, will fall on the shoulders of the local authority. So that's a massive force economy, you know, to actually ignore that, that the housing factor. So that's the first part of my holistic look at the data. Once you're satisfied then, you should then start to look at big data and gather data together. And I think this is the role of the enforcement agent. I think this is where local authorities and enforcement agents could come much closer together and look at this work around you know, the picture of the debtor, looking at the at the wider issues and actually helping the debtor out of these problems. I've looked a couple of times at this project, this reimagined debt project and the use of technology and the use of a, a particular dashboard that appears to help identify um, people's, uh, you know, people's rights to various debt, uh, to various assistance. The interesting thing is that you don't really need a piece of software. It's nice to have a piece of software, but there are plenty of people in the local authority that can actually address that issue. You've got benefit staff working on council tax reduction and housing benefit who are incredibly expert in these matters. And, and you just have to look at the wider issues and make the best use of all the data you have in the local authority to segment your data and then take the appropriate action. And I think that's the area where um, where, where the enforcement agent and the local authority can come closer together. It's interesting. The other, you know, it's interesting listening to Jonathan making the comment about costs and the, the effect of the costs on the administration. That's another major issue. I think over the years, local authorities have looked at the costs they raise in the magistrates court, for example. This is before we get to the enforcement process. And those costs have become almost like a budget supplement. And they're not really truly reflected. We've had a little bit of, you know, rumbles in the courts around that issue and it was an issue a couple of years ago and i think there's something to be looked at there they, they, there could be a smarter and smoother process in the magistrates court to get you to liability order stage and then it's much easier to actually look at the holistic situation because you'll have various remedies available to you but what we shouldn't be doing is adding as both nick and jonathan have said to the burden on the debtor by adding unnecessary costs and a lot of those costs fall at the first you know tend to uh, surface at the first stage so it's a holistic picture the enforcement agent working close with the local authority and sharing expertise the the majority of enforcement companies now have got super software looking at these situations and they use it very effectively and I would just say, if I could, David, is that uh, I think what the government, central governments have achieved through their debt market integration approach that we all know isn't perfect, but it has some value. If if you could achieve that in local government, but for enforcement, so it's not a, you know, you're not giving up the, the power and hand it over to, to, to cabinet office. But at, at JBW, we were dealing with around 200,000 judgment debts a year. 64% of the debtors were repeat offenders, so we had more than one debt for them on the system. So, you know, part, few bargain fines or parking and, and council tax, etc. So immediately, if you were to get all local authorities to go through an integrator, you would reduce the fees passed on to debtors by over 50%. And that would be taking two hundred million pounds out of the private sector and putting it straight into local government. Because if it doesn't go to the, the, the enforcement agent for charging more fees, it will go to pay off the principal amount quicker. And I think that's certainly where I have my uh, head at the moment is how do you make that happen? If we can reduce the impact on the debtor by two hundred million across the industry, that, that in turn means that the principal amount gets it back in the, uh, the, the, the coffers of the local authority much quicker and more efficiently. 
um, then that must be a good thing. And I think with those sort of numbers, it's something that, that should have some energy and, and could be achieved. Jamie. Nick, um, as, as notwithstanding you know, the additional challenges that, that you've had with the new grant schemes and everything else being rolled out fairly quickly, ideas around a, you know, a, a, a single view, a common view of debtors and, and sort of taking a much more holistic approach to all the, the sort of perspectives that local authorities should take around vulnerability, problems for families, etc. Um, so, so these ideas aren't necessarily new. Um, what's sort of stopping you at a local level from actually exploring that concept that Jane was talking about in terms of, of you know, bringing all your debts into one place, placing them with a single um, uh, enforcement agent and, and trying to, to gain efficiencies both for you and also lower fees for, for your, um, your debtors. What's really stopping you at a local level sort of exploring those types of, of, of new ways of working? I mean, I think the answer I would say is most authorities are trying to work towards that solution and with varying degrees of success. Um, I think a lot of the issues are historical. Um, you have council departments that for many years, and I think this is changing now, worked in silo mentalities where you know the parking department didn't speak to the revenues department, crazy situations. And I think those times are changing but you do still have historical arrangements, historical con uh, contracts set up, and also working relationships where people are happy and contented with the enforcement agents they've used for a number of years who know the, um, the patch they work on. And you quite often find you know, someone who knows the area, knows the debtors, is a significant step forward. I think in terms of um, data sharing, we could still do more. There are still some um, legislative barriers that I would like to see eased um, around the gateway to internal data sharing. I think there is certainly more could be done around external data sharing. At the last talk, we spoke about the um, HMRC data and you know the pilot that's commenced for that. That would make a significant impact on local authorities' ability to a identify a customer circumstances. At the moment, as we talked about today, often the way we find out most about a customer, apart from our internal data, is by speaking to them. So the more we can find out before we have that conversation, we're pre-armed with that data. It makes it far easier to get down to those conversations with the customers as they contact us. So I think there could be more done around um, legal gateways as well as local authorities reviewing internal practices as well. Okay. Jonathan, is those things that Nick mentioned to me sound familiar or are there some different challenges that you face in, in your locality? Well, the single view of debt has been tried uh, in, in many places in many different incarnations, I think, for, for, for several years. And there's some authorities that are really making uh, good Get a good a better better outcomes from that than, than others. I think there needs to be the will to overcome those hurdles that that Nick talks about, and you, we really need to be challenging both government on on the use of data and challenging each other on on those protections that we've built over the years. I mean, it's a bit like you would never build a local authority today to look like it does. I mean, it's so inefficient. We need to be able to bring the housing team to work with the council tax team with the parking team with the sundry debt team they need to be why, why are we doing why are we replicating four or five processes in the same silos yes there, there's some separation of um, the, the debt types and the priorities of debts but that's where you can where it come it gets it becomes difficult if you were building this from the outset you probably you would have overcome those 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 issues in 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 in, in, in building it together I think for me that we, we've got now an opportunity to to look at this um, both internally and externally and bring and bring that best best of breed together. We've seen local authorities um, and, and so we've seen enforcement agents doing a lot of work in understanding our debt because they're dealing with the parking debt and they're dealing with the council tax debt. So they they've managed to bring it together. So why can't we do that internally? I have one reservation though. I mean, whilst it all sounds great and we ought to be doing it, you know, this, this isn't a barrier, but it does strike me that the more in intelligence that we have within the council tax team, if you just take one, 
would we be as, as successful in collecting what we've collected? So the more data we know about somebody might put us off making those decisions that we have been making. Now that's a difficult one to sort of square because in some respects it's the right thing to do, but actually for me and my own personal targets and the, the local authority objective is to collect, raise that council tax. Is it just to create more awareness of our vulnerabilities? Because that's not going to collect our council tax and it's not going to change the budget outcome. Budget has still been set at that number. So I don't know how we're going to balance that, but it is, this is, I'm, I'm got more questions than answers, I reckon. <laughs> As always, um, interesting point though, which is um, about the use of discretion. Um, so, I mean, we've seen lots of, of the policy areas central government saying actually, you know, local authorities should be taking more discretion over the way they, they run things. Um, and some of the changes to business rates has been no, you know, a design to actually try and try and do that if they ever come to come, come to fruition. But you, you know, in your sector, how, how hard should you push? Where should you use your discretion? And, and should anything ever be off the table when you start collecting debts, do you think? So, for, I mean, you, you separate the two vulnerabilities. I mean, the council tax vulnerable residents at the moment are being quite well looked after. Those are already receiving some CTR in some authorities. You've got this postcode lottery. That, that we know so much about that in some authorities the most vulnerable are already supported with 100% uh, of their council tax. In others, um, uh, as, in, as, in, as in Redbridge, you know, they're making a substantial contribution even when they're not working. But that group that have been supported throughout have now been given an additional £150 when actually their circumstances aren't any different from what they were pre, pre COVID and 19. So I think we need to recognize that if we've got discretions, we need to channel those discretions in the right place. And so far, I'm not, I'm not convinced that we've actually supported the right cohort. Because as we said in the last seminar, the cohort that I'm most concerned about, and David mentioned it earlier, is that, is that group of the working age who are now either furloughed or and furloughed and just don't know that they're going to be made redundant in a few weeks time. We've seen it now. Um, David, David mentioned, um, uh, the, the airline, but also also um, high street high street chains are, 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 for, are, are closing by the day now. So we're, we're going to be we're going to be dealing with that raft of, of people. So if we if we have got some discretion, how do we save our purse? Because at the moment we can start allocating some discretionary money towards their council tax. Yeah, that will work. It's a bit of a sticking blaster for now. It doesn't solve the problem long term. This is an eight, we're only at the end of, in the June, beginning of July today. We've got an, another number of months to get through where that money's got to last. You know, we haven't got a bottomless pit, albeit the regulations mean that we do have to have a bottomless pit, but we can't afford it. It's unsustainable. I'm not quite sure what we're going to do there, but discretions need to be applied fairly and consistently. So I think we'll be, be a bit cautious about how we, how we start to allocate some of that, that funding. Um, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are businesses that are vulnerable as well. But I'll, I'll, I'll pause for a moment and conscious of the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me ask David the question about them. David, you mentioned the um, the new Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act um, that's going through through Parliament at the moment, um, and also with the introduction of um, green space sometime next year. Um, these are all, up, you know, sort of. Uh, as I see them, to tools of sort of central government perhaps taking discretion away from local government um, in terms of applying more sort of you know top-down uh, rules and regulations around how things should happen. Do you and as the institute see it that way, or, or, or do you be, are you arguing for more top-down direction or uh, guidance from government, or perhaps more bottom discretion for local authorities? Well, if I could just talk about one quick thing on council tax before I just quick move to business rates on on council tax, I am still mystified why the government got rid of council tax benefit. It remains to me the biggest mystery under the sun. They, it was a ridiculous decision. It was to create a false saving target for the DWP, and they were able to achieve it by dropping the expenditure on council tax benefit past the local authorities, and they immediately passed that extra burden to local authorities, and it was immediately financed from the 50% of the retained business rates. And the whole decision process around that was crazy. And if the government wanted to do something today to help, 
go back to a national council tax benefit scheme with 100% benefit at the measurement of need and the measurement of resources matching. That's where they should be, and that's such a simple decision to make. Going on to business rates, I don't think the problems have really started yet with business rates. We've got a large chunk of the of the rating community who are exempt from their rate bills this year. So they've, they've forgotten how to pay for this year. Next year, they're going to have to be re-educated. And that's going to be a, that's going to be tough because they will, have, they will close their accounts and they'll look at them and say, Cricket, that massive rate burden, we didn't have to pay it last year. Now we've got to pay it. And that's going to be painful for a start. But the real impact is the ability of businesses to actually pay their rates. Their, their profits are going to be down. They're going to be under immense pressure. And it's not just the retail sector, it's the whole picture. And I just worry about where we're going to be by the end of this year, where we won't feel the full impact, but we'll start to feel it. And then through next year, when this massive group of rate payers who haven't paid anything for a year, suddenly have got to pay. And when you're seeing the real in, you know, the real pressure on other businesses to meet, meet their rate bill. The, the Corporate Insolvency and, and, and Governance Act is quite interesting because the creation of moratoriums and the various other devices that are in there are going to slow down the recovery process. They're giving, quite rightly, companies in real difficulty the opportunity to actually pause their difficulties to try and reorganize their business. So these things are, are great to have, but they're going to put immense pressure on local authorities. And, and it's interesting about the gap. Yeah, in fact, just interrupt you for a moment. Um, I'm yeah. conscious of the time, and uh, we, we have a businessman on the panel, Dave, uh, Jamie. What's your impression of uh, of a situation around business rates, and, and what support do you think businesses are expecting from either local authorities or central government now that we're getting to this period? So um, I agree with David. I think um, I I've, uh, certainly. In the, again, going back to the utility sector, the ones that are supplying business premises, we are having serious conversations with them on if they're ever going to recover their money, to be honest with you. Because what we are seeing, the landlords are making really sensible decisions about how they enforce rent arrears, and they've already made those decisions because their businesses rely upon it. And what they are in the main, so IAG, your own um, uh, Regis, Regis offices, we work, and know the, the, the bit, some of the biggest landlords, in the world, we are working with some of them at the moment on how you go into a business that hasn't paid its rent, take control of its assets, but then do not throw it out of the premises, but put it on a suitable payment plan over an extended period of time to get them back up to speed. And that extended period of time might be two, three years. Um, now, if that's the case, whenever an enforcement agent turns up with a business rate debt, or a, a water debt or an energy debt, they're just going to be told to go away because what is clear and actually should be shared with, with the participants today is that on the 16th of March, it was lost in the noise of COVID-19, but there was a, a, a quarter, uh, there was a court of appeal case feature in Marston Group and JBW Group, uh, where JBW Group lost the case. Uh, and the judge had reenacted a, a, an ancient piece of law from but roughly 500 years ago that said the priority of debt exists uh, when when it comes to enforcement, which means that if you get your uh, if you send your court order to a bailiff first, you are entitled to the money first, regardless of whoever gets there. So to put that in practical terms, if um, if Nick had a, a judgment for a, 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 a debtor, be it a person or a business, um, and sent sent me the case, um, and then Jonathan got a judgment two weeks later and sent uh, Marston the case, or let's use David for an example, sent David the case. If David went out straight away and recovered the money, I can say to David, David, you've got to hand that money to me because Nick had sent me a judgment. I hadn't got there yet but it's my money because I sit in priority. And I think that that case law that was handed down on the 16th of March, which everybody has been pretty silent about because the impact is fairly huge, could be the biggest change in the enforcement sector, uh, even bigger than the 2014 regulations. And actually, I personally think if you take that, which is called the, the order of priority judgment and do it well, it could be also the best thing that's happened for the enforcement agent. 
the enforcement industry because what it does is it it, it stops this sort of you know first past the post environment where bailiffs have to get their money and they have to get it quickly just in case there's another bailiff around the corner it reduces the impact on on the the public by over 50 percent of fees will come straight out of uh, the the private sector and into the creditors pocket which means the creditors will get paid faster so i think it's it's sad for some of the enforcement companies that are absolutely going to reduce in size because of this uh, over a period of time. But I think the opportunities for creditors uh, is immense, and I, I think it's pretty exciting. And I think we can share with the participants that judgment after this um, session for it. Uh, I can provide you with a copy of that. Uh, we just had a question about that, so I think that would be very useful if we could share that. Um, on that note, so thank you for that, Jamie. It's a shame we've run out of time because that sounds like a very interesting uh, development that, that would be useful to explore. Um, on that note, um, can I thank you all for, for joining us today? Uh, apologies, we are slightly over, over time. And also thank our, our panel, um, David Mago, Nick Grove, Jamie Waller and Jonathan Woolridge for joining us today. Um, just to let you know that we have a final webinar planned in this series on the 15th of July. I hope you can be able to join us then. Uh, we'll have to send that information about that uh, shortly. Uh, and also, again, at the end of this webinar, you should get a uh, invitation to fill out a questionnaire uh, about our performance today. So uh, we do we enjoy reading those comments, and, and, and uh, you will have found this session useful. So um, can I bring this session to a close? And uh, thank you all for joining, and we we'll look forward to seeing you again in, in two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.